All right, so today we're going to be talking about why were there revolutions in France in 1830 and 1848, basically the continuing saga of crazy political instability in France. Um, now remember, in 1830, there are going to be, well, I didn't type this, but there's a series of revolutions that are going to break out in 1830, and there's going to be a series of revolutions across Europe that are going to break out in 1848. So we're going to start talking about Louis XVIII and how would Louis XVIII rule France. So remember... Um, in the Congress of Vienna, the desire was to try to kind of turn back the clock, um, kind of erase what happened during the French Revolution. So it's decided that the Bourbon monarchy is going to be restored um, to France. So this is known as the Restoration Era, which lasts from 1815 to 1830. Um, so France emerged from the chaos of its revolutionary period as one of the most liberal large states in Europe. So Louis XVIII kind of comes in knowing that if he tries to bring back the old regime, it's not going to work. So he governs France as a constitutional monarch. So he agrees to observe the 1814 Charter, or the Constitution of the Restoration Period, which created um, limited royal power, granted legislative power, protected the civil rights, and upheld the Napoleonic Code. Um, like I said, he's a constitutional monarch, but he tries to be one of his own making. So we have a hereditary monarchy, we have a bicameral le legislature. Um, however, um, well, wait a second. however, the monarch appointed the upper house. So two legislature, two houses. The lower house was the chamber of deputies. Um, that was elected. But again, given that this is a liberal government, um, it's only open, the only people who can vote are a small group within the French government, French people that has a lot of property. And then the upper house, um, he gets to pick. This did, though, like we said here, limits its world power, guarantees legislative power, protects civil rights. This did guarantee the rights that were enthroned in the Declaration of the Rights of Man of Citizen, like religious toleration. Uh, they didn't, again, challenge the property rights of confiscated land during the Revolution because they knew that that would completely pose, cause them to lose support of the people. Um, and he wanted to try to reconcile the re regime with those who had benefited from the revolution. Because, again, he's trying to be a little bit practical here and realize that he needs to be able to govern the country. Um, now, you also have, though, what are referred to as the ultras. France was divided by those who had accepted the ideas of the French Revolution and those who did it. So the Count of Artois was the leader of the ultra-royalists, who are sometimes referred to as the royalists. Um, and they were the ones who had wanted to bring back um, what it was like before the revolution. They were angry by what had happened um, during the revolution. This was led again by um, the Count of Artois, who was eventually going to be the king of France after Louis XVIII dies, so this is not going to go too well um, for him in the long run. But the royalists demanded revenge, and so that's why they instituted a white terror. Um, and this was revolutionaries. Uh, they, they targeted revolutionaries and people who had supported Napoleon. So the royalist mobs killed thousands of former revolutionaries. And the king, though, did very little to stop the bloodbath. So in the 1816 elections, um, the ultras were rejected in the Chamber of Deputies election in the favor of a more moderate royalist majority dependent on middle-class support. So there's this struggle going on within France. Um, like, like I said, Louis XVIII didn't really do much to stop this white terror, but um, he does try to create a government that he can govern with, and he does try to work with the middle class. However, this is going to change um, with the assassination of the king's nephew. So how would the assassination of the king's nephew um, change his policies? So Charles Ferdinand de Artois was the second son of the Count of Artois, which was the future Charles X. Um, so in 1820, the Duke of Berry, he's murdered. Um, he was third in line of the throne. The ultras were convinced that um, this was a result of the minister's cooperation with, like, the Okay, sorry. The ultra royals were convinced that this murder happened because Louis was cooperating with liberal politicians. Um, and so the royalists blame the left, and Louis XVIII moves the government more to the right. Like, he's very upset about the death of his nephew. Um, he changes the electoral laws, which narrows the, the eligible voters. Censorship was imposed. 
liberals were driven out of legal political life and into legal into illegal activities. Um, people suspected of dangerous political activity could be arbitrarily arrested. Um, secondary education was under the control of the Roman Catholic bishops, um, and basically the liberals were being driven out. So this is creating a tension developing. Um, French troops then were authorized by the Council of Europe. This is something separate um, to restore the Bourbon, another Bourbon ruler, Ferdinand VII, to the throne there. Um, but we start to see this conservative backlash against a liberal type of government and then exacerbated by the assassination of this little boy. So, Charles X. How would Charles' ultra loyalist views influence his policy? So, Charles X is going to succeed his brother Louis. He's the father of the son of the little boy that was killed, and he's going to become king in 1824. Um, his goals. He wants to lessen the influence of the middle class. Like he wants to kind of turn things back. He wants to limit the right to vote. He puts the clergy back in charge of education. He puts he uses public money to pay the nobles for the loss that they learned during land during the French Revolution. And remember, that's like the one thing that everyone kind of upheld the land having been seized from the monarch, from the nobility. So he attacks the 1814 charter. He wants to continue this control of the press. Um, and he dismisses the Chamber of Deputies when it kind of revolted against him. And he appoints an ultra, ultra reactionary as his first minister. Um, so basically, he also lowers the interest rate on government bonds to pay this annual sum to the emergés who lost land. So the middle class bondholders lost income because they were the ones who had bought the bonds in the first place. Um, the reason why he's going to dismiss the Chamber of Deputies because in the elections of 1827, the liberals gained a lot of seats um, and he kind of decides to work with them in the beginning. He tries to become a little bit less conservative um, and he eased up on some of his laws of censorship. But the liberals were not happy with what he was going to do, so that's why he kind of eventually dismisses the Chamber of Deputies in 1829, um, replaces his moderate ministry with an ultra-royalist one, opposes um, negotiations with more liberal groups in the government. So in 1830, he calls for new elections, and the liberals won another stunning victory. So how did the four ordinances end Charles's power? So... Charles X, like I said, the election of 1830 brought in a liberal majority, and he issued something called the July Ordinances. So with the July Ordinances, he um, basically stages a royal coup. Um, and the reason why he was kind of able to do this is um, France was beginning to take colonies in North Africa. Everyone was really, really excited about the fact that France was starting to have an empire, and he took advantage of the, that good feeling and goodwill to issue the four ordinances, ordin the July ordinances, or the four ordinances, um, on July 20th, 1830, which essentially was a royal coup, because he dissolves the entire parliament, he reimposes very strict censorship of the press, he changed the voting laws so that the government in the future would always have conservative people in power, because only the wealthiest, wealthiest people could vote, and then... He used that, those elections, then he called the new elections with newing just this tiny, tiny, narrow section of the electorate to get the people he wanted um, to come into power. So this provoked very swift, popular reactions. Um, basically, the people are going to get very upset. Um, liberal newspapers called on the nation to reject the, the, the actions of Charles X. The working class erected barricades. The king called in troops. About 1,800 people died during the battles. You can see the Friends of Liberty, the commemoration of the recent glorious triumph of tyranny in France. Um, so I'll talk about Belgian independence in a second. But basically on August 2nd, uh, Charles abdicates and leaves France uh, to go to England for exile. Um, also during all this time, Belgium declared its independence. Um, its union with Holland after the Congress of Vienna had not proved successful. Um, there had been very little popular support for Belgian nationalism prior to 1830, um, but then this nationalism kind of rises very quickly. And we see this wide cultural differences break out within the Netherlands. The North is mostly Dutch and Protestant. 
The South is mostly French and Catholic, and we see this division in Belgium to Christ's independence while all this is going on. But, so basically, um, on August 2nd, uh, Charles, the, Charles X abdicates, leaves France for England, the Chamber of Deputies proclaims um, Charles's cousin Louis-Philippe, the Duke of Orleans, the King of France. Um, if Charles had sent in enough troops to Paris, the outcome might have been different. Had the liberals not acted very quickly, the workers of Paris might have attempted to form another republic, but instead we see a continuation of the monarchy, which takes us to this problem. Was Louis-Philippe able to fix the problems? Um, so he's the king of France from 1830 until 1848. Um, so Louis-Philippe is known as the citizen king. He was a cousin of the Bourbons. Um, he was the Duke of Orleans. Um, he basically was not part of this whole group of the ultras. He was seen as being much more bourgeoisie. Um, his program was to have property qualifications reduced enough to double the eligible voters. He gets rid of censorship of the press. He felt that the king ruled by the will of people, not by the will of God. Um, this is when the French uh, Revolution's tricolor flag, the flag that the current flag of France replaces the bourbon flag, which is the white with the yellow fleur de lis. The government was now under the control of a wealthy middle class. So he tries to kind of change things. Um, Catholicism becomes the religion of the majority of the people rather than the official religion. The king is willing to work with the Chamber of Deputies, um, but could not dispense laws on their own authority to still to get the approval of the king. Um, overall for France, though, the everyday economic, political, and social influence of the lands and oligarchy is going to continue. The liberal monarchy had little or no sympathy for the working and lower classes. Um, the workers were demanding protection for their jobs, better wages, a preservation of traditional crafts, and all of these were basically ignored. Um, so, and this was going to be a problem. He's ignoring the needs and demands of the workers. Um, he felt that they were basically a nuisance and a source of possible disorder. So, um, in late 1831, the troops are going to suppress a workers' revolt in Lyon. And then in July of 1832, there's going to be an uprising in Paris. It was put down by force, and about 800 were killed or wounded. This was known as the July Days. This occurred during a funeral of a popular Napoleonic general, because people still love Napoleon. Um, in 1834, the silk workers strike in Lyon, and this was crushed. Um, and this showing that the lower classes are really, really upset. They basically feel like they're not, um, their concerns are not taking into consideration. And... You could smother their discontent for a while, but unless you actually start to do anything to improve uh, their social and economic conditions, um, they're just going to rise back up again, which is essentially what's going to happen. So, how would the people express their discontent with the rule of Louis Philippe? And look at this quote here. It says, A look of Paris. In the city I found 100,000 workers armed, organized, and without work, dying of hunger, but their minds filled with useless theories of fantastic hopes. I saw society divided in two, those who owned nothing reunited in one common desire, while those who owned something reunited in common anguish. Between these two great classes, a sympathy remained, or um, the ideas inevitable and pending, a struggle had taken hold. So you can see the giant sea state um, of the revolution coming of 1848. Here is Louis Philippe was regarded as the pair, and he's got all kind of caricatures of, caricatures of her, of him, excuse me. Um, so you can see, like, they felt that, like, Louis' throne, Louis Philippe's throne was not too stable. Um, so in February, February 22nd of 1848, uh, the working class and liberals unhappy with Louis Philippe, especially his minister, Francois Guizot, um, the, ref the reform banquets used to protest against the king. Um, Paris, the Paris banquet was banned. Um, troops opened fire on peaceful protesters. The barricades are erected. There's also the looting. Um, the National Guard defects to the radicals, and King Louis loses control of Paris and abdicates on February, um, February 24th. Um, so, Basically, liberals then are going to organize a coalition government, uh, organize, excuse me, a provisional government 
um, and then to hold an election to write a new constitution. So people like Louis Blanc, I talked about him, um, wait, sorry, skip Louis. Alphonse Lamartine, he was a poet and a liberal and believed in the rights of man to vote, to free speech, to property, and to a secular education, and he declared a new provisional government. Um, but the conservatives and the liberals are very suspicious of the idea of creating a new republic because they fear, again, the reign of terror. So republic kind of still equals terror. Louis Blanc, I talked about him as the rise of the socialists. Um, he believed in the right to work and believing that there should be national workshops to provide work for the unemployed. Um, but we can see that there's basically an economic crisis kind of building in France as well. So, um, Alex de Tocqueville said, Gentlemen, it is my profound conviction that we are asleep on our volcano. Of this I am certain. Yes, the danger is great. Let us take steps to prevent it while there is still time. Um, the French constitute the most brilliant and most dangerous nation in Europe and the best qualified in turn to become an object of admiration, hatred, pity, or terror, but never indifference. The man who asks for freedom, anything other than itself, is born to be a slave. So, um, between March and May, they're working on kind of creating a new constitution for France. Uh, the working class in Paris wanted social and political revolutions, and they were led by people like Louis Blanc. Um, but the provisional government... Um, wasn't kind of agreeing with this. So we're starting to see conflicts break out between liberals and socialists over the timing of the elections to the Constitutional Assembly, the cost of government social programs, do they really violate, do they violate less than fair, the question of whether you could have liberty for all men and still have a system based on private property, um, growing social tensions between the working classes and the bourgeoisie in regards to the nature of work, the right to unionize, and pay levels. So... In April, April 23rd, there's an election based on universal, universal male suffrage, um, and they chose a new national assembly. Um, and it resulted in a conservative majority of the national assembly, and they began debating the fate of social programs. The conservative majority wanted the removal of radicals like Blanc from the government. In early June, the national workshop was shut down, and this is all just kind of like heightening um, the class tensions. So in May, government troops um, and the parish crowd flashes, barricades are built, um, and in June 24th, the troops are, put to, are sent in to put down the revolts. And these are known as the June days. So workers, groups in Paris rose up in insurrection. Um, they said that the government had betrayed the revolution and the workers wanted a redistribution of wealth. There was barricades in the streets, um, and this is actually what Les Mis is based on but a new liberal conservative coalition forms to oppose this lower class radicalism. That 400 people were killed in the fighting um, and troops hunted about 3,000 people and arrested them. So here you can see the barricades again. Uh, so, uh, first thing I entered the chamber, the session that you the venue, the deputies wandered the corner as if they were lost, hungry, hungry for rumors and without news. So the July monarchy fell, collapsing without a fight, rather than succumbing to the blows of his conquerors, who were amazed by their victory in the vanquished war and their defeat. Um, and you can see actually the pictures of what some of these barricades look like. So how is all of this going to lead to the lies of someone like Louis Napoleon? So the June day is confirmed. Um, the political predominance of the conservative property owners. Everyone was fearful that they were going to go back into a crazy reign of terror again, and no one wanted that. Um, so basically, Louis Napoleon is going to win the presidential election. He was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. They turned basically to the Bonaparte name because people saw it as a, as a source of stability and of greatness. Um, Louis Napoleon really was dedicated to his own fame, though, rather than upholding the ideas of a republic. But he comes to power as an elected president in the Constitution of 1848 that is created. Oops, sorry. So, as president, Louis Napoleon, um, the December election, the law and order candidate Louis Napoleon Bonaparte um, comes to power. So the big shift in the middle class opinion to the right. He purges the government of all radical officials. He replaces them with ultra-conservatives and monarchists. He disbands the National Assembly and holds new elections. 
He represented himself as a man of the people, um, and his government regularly used force against dissenters. So, in 1851, Louis Napoleon is going to declare a hereditary Second French Empire. And basically, he fought with the National Assembly, claimed that he only represented the will of the nation. In 1851, the Assembly refused to change a law that allowed a president to run for re-election. So on December 2nd, 1851, Napoleon is going to seize personal power. And the troops are going to disperse the assembly, and the president is going to call for new elections. Um, 200 people died resisting the coup. About 26,000 people were arrested. 10,000 people were transported to Algeria. There was a plebiscite on December 21st, 1851, and 7.5 million voters supported Louis Napoleon, approved the new constitution, consolidating his power, and he became Emperor Napoleon the third. So, could, can France have a peaceful and stable government? Think about that. Is it actually possible at this point in France's history? 